Hello, and welcome to this Art and Art History panel. Um, it's a School of Fine Arts Art and Art History panel. So uh, just so that everybody knows where our umbrella ship is located, that is the School of Fine Arts. So we are representing Art and Art History today. I'm Coraline Dibler, Professor of Illustration, and I'm here at UConn for the last 26 years or so, which is how I get to know such great folks as our current featured alumni. Um, today, we have an opportunity to hear from two really wonderful alumni from our illustration and animation concentration, and we'll be in conversation with them about their career journey and how their experiences and their lessons uh, shaped who they are since graduation. And that conversation, we're hoping, helps current and future students as well. So during this, uh, this presentation, I've prepared a few questions. And I'm hoping that folks who are in the audience will add questions to the chat too. So if you've got questions, you ought to be able to access the chat and put your questions there. So I'll ask some questions up front. We'll talk for a little while and then we'll access the chat as well. And at the conclusion, uh, students will have an option to join one of the panelists for a breakout space experience, actual real time networking also known as relationship building. And so um, I'd like to start by asking both Mike Parker and Dr. Audra Pittman to introduce themselves and give us a brief introduction to who you are and where you are and what you're up to now. And I'll just um, do this. And it landed on Mike. <laughs> uh, Mike, would you go first? Sure. Hey, everybody. I'm Mike Parker. Um, I graduated in uh, 2001. Um, I'm currently uh, the creative director and owner of Lowbrow Studios. We're an animation studio here in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, I've been doing animation for over 20 years now. Started at UConn um, with the help of Coraline. And um, yeah, started out as just something to do after my regular job. And then um, after a few years, took it on as freelance and then uh, built out a studio from there. And, and let's be clear. Um, not much help from Coraline. <laughs> I believe Mike came to me and said, can I do an independent study in animation? And I was like, yeah, sure. All right. I signed his form and then he was off to the races. No, at the time it was like flash animation was a new thing, believe yeah. it or not. And I didn't know anything about flash animation, but I did know storytelling and that's how we work together. And I couldn't be more proud of where you have ended up. Oh, thank um, you. And the same goes for Dr. Pittman, would you please tell us, sign in please, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, Lord, the story is so long. I'll try to give you the most abridged version. Uh, graduated UConn in 2000, God, way over two decades now, Corlin. Um, there was no Instagram and Facebook and all the great things y'all have. Um, I think we were just getting Google, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, my, my story is kind of long and winding, but I was a middle school teacher, uh, decided to get my doctorate in art education, arts administration, art museum education, because, you know, just can never stop learning. And uh, taught at a small university in South Carolina. I get into all this stuff later. Uh, started working for SCAD. I ran a master of arts and teaching program where I certified art and drama teachers. Left to start my own studio. Then I started volunteering, worked in the government, and I called SCAD because I loved working there. I talked to the president and founder and said, I want a job in Atlanta. And I became the vice president for SCAD Atlanta. And actually I haven't even updated my LinkedIn. I am now the vice president for development for all of SCAD. Uh, we call it giving. So I bring in the money for scholarships and endowments and sponsorships and all the fun things. But whew, <laughs> I really tried to condense it because it's that a was lot. good. Good job. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame you don't do more. <laughs> Really, <laughs> I mean, gosh, you know, that's that's a real shame. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what I noticed, too, and I because, of course, I haven't sometimes I see you online and we exchange notes or whatever, but I haven't talked with you in person in quite a while. And I noticed that you've indeed picked up that, um, oh, that southern, southern accent. Y'all, I get made fun <laughs> yeah. of all the time. Like Connecticut, the most voice neutral state there is. And then <laughs> it's two days in yeah. Atlanta, Savannah. I'm done. <laughs> yes. Pretty much. Well, welcome to both of you. I, like I said, I'm thrilled. I love I love keeping up with what alums are doing, and I'm so proud of what you both have have accomplished. But I think a lot of times for our students, 
it's a little bit hard to see how you get from here to there. And um, we often have this idea that it's, we have to have kind of a clear vision and then that vision is what happens. And so often that's actually not the case. So we, we have to start out with that. It's like what gives you traction, right? Have ideas about what you want to do next. Um, so what I'm kind of thinking about wanting to ask you about first is, did your younger self picture where your current self is now? Or mm -hmm. yes, no, somewhere in the middle? Or how did that work? I mean, I could start, not at all. I had no idea. I stressed over, I still stress over it. Like, what am I gonna do when I grow up? Oh, I'm a grown up, I'm adulting fully, still trying to figure it out. Um, no, I think Coraline, when I was in middle school, high school, I thought I was gonna be a children's book illustrator living in France, designing fashions. That was it. I took French, nobody took French. I don't know why I picked like one of the most complicated languages. I thought I live in Paris, never been there, didn't know and whatever. So, um, but I still picked up the love of, you know, storytelling books. I still doodle everywhere, but um, I think it kind of carried forward into all the decisions I did end up making, but oh my gosh, no. And I still call my, I call my friends, my board of advisors. What should I do next? What do you think? Da, 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 and ask my husband and yeah, it, it's all over the place. Still don't know, still figuring it out. <laughs> I, I think that's going to be uniquely comforting to a lot of us. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. It, it, very similar for me. I knew that, you know, uh, when I was a kid, I loved drawing and just making like cartoons or anything like that, just anything with art and just uh, cartoons, especially. Um, that just gave me like a vague direction of like, I want to make cartoons. I don't know what that means as a career or anything, but it was just like a passion that I tried to follow throughout. Um, and, you know, eventually just kind of figuring it out as I, as I went, I was, you know, um, when I was in, when I was at UConn, uh, I saw an opportunity to make comics when, uh, for the, um, for the paper. And that was like a creative outlet and I got to draw and I actually got paid for it, which was crazy. So that was just like sort of motivating to like, what else can I do? Like, this is, a, this is a, the very start of a career path. So let me follow this still not really knowing like, what is the end goal? Um, and then when, graduate, you know, I'm just doing it at home at night as like a passion and just something that I really love doing. And then just following that and uh, just a lot of hard work and late nights and stuff, but like opportunities start to present themselves and you sort of follow your gut or, or you just kind of um, see what, see where that takes you. But still, even with that, like not having a, a clear path, I wasn't one to like go to Los Angeles or like um, another sort of like school just strictly for animation or anything like that but it was just like this is what I like to do I'm just going to keep doing it and let's see where it gets me and I feel like I'm still like that now you know with just projects and everything that come in but um but yeah that's you know that's pretty much how we got how I got where we are totally I think we may have lost Cora did we lose Coraline we may have lost her for a second oh no I don't know <laughs> But, um, you know, I'll, I'll continue off of sure. that. You know, I think, I mean, I don't know if she's going to go ahead with this, but like kind of the best words of advice are really just like you said, following your passion. Um, sometimes it's hard to think of like, well, what's my passion? Well, it's the thing you do when you first wake up. It's the first thing you're thinking about what you're consumed with. Um, my husband's always like, you're always shopping. I'm always looking at fashions. I'm always in the fashion department at SCAD bothering them. What are you designing for me and my size? You know, and and it's funny, like, I just happen to be in this environment that supports it and where, you know, I'm supporting students and, you know, I just love that. So um, when I was younger, when I was actually at UConn, um, I remember one summer I worked at Real Artways and I don't even know if they're still around and they still do this, but they had the summer camp. And th again, this is like before y'all could just Google jobs in the arts. Like I just <laughs> really didn't <laughs> know what I was going to do. And I remember teaching in a summer program. Oh, Ross, okay, good. Um, and I was wondering like, wait, I can get paid to be a teacher. Like I can order art supplies all day, paint and draw with kids. Like, absolutely. So um, that's when I started looking into master's programs and our education. And so I taught middle school a couple of years and it was just so much fun. So, you know, I don't, I think, you know, be open to what's out there, take advantage, say yes to opportunities because it could prepare you for something else. Like 
the real art ways thing. I just said yes because I met someone who's like, hey, do you want to work? I'm like, sure, that sounds great. And then it led me get my master's teaching middle school, um, which made me think, oh, maybe the university level is where I want to be. And so that's why I kind of came down to Florida State to get a PhD in art ed, be a professor. So it all it all lends itself. I never had this clear path, but I will say my mom was working at UConn when I was getting my undergrad. Um, she was the director of the African American Cultural Center, Belina Kimson Price. And she was getting her doctorate when I was an undergrad. So I would go to the library corral, if, even if they still had those and steal snacks from her. So, you know, <laughs> look who's around you, look who influences you, you know, kind of see what they're doing. They, they may be doing something that, you know, spurns something else. So. Definitely. Yeah. I, especially the part that you're talking about, you know, just saying yes to opportunities that come along. Um, for me, that was, you know, something that was, it still is too, just, it's an exciting, it's, it's sort of, if it's something, if an opportunity comes along and, you know, automatically you're excited about whatever it's going to be, like, that's sort of an indication of like, oh, this might be something that I'm interested in pursuing further on and just say yes to it and just see where that takes you. And, you know, if it's something either way out of it, you're going to get an, uh, an experience out of it. If you, if you end up not liking it, then it's like, all right, well, let me just refine it from there and see what else in this industry that I like to do. And if it's something that you really like, then great. Try to pursue more stuff in that, uh, you know, in that range of uh, opportunities. And, you know, it's just going from one to another. This is really focused around like not, you know, you might have a clear, like, I want to make, you know, I just want to be like, a, I, want, I want to strictly be an, a background artist or something like that. And like, that's fantastic. You know, there's plenty of stuff where you can focus strictly on that. But if you just know, like, I, I like the art field, I like being creative, that sort of thing. Like there's plenty, whenever an opportunity comes along, like, you know, if you, if it feels right for you, like definitely say yes and uh, see where, see where it takes you. What, what did I miss kids? There was Everything. an explosion. There was an explosion path. here we're outside. There was a bright flash, and then we had no power, so I had oh, to Lord. reboot the um, router. Yeah. Yeah. You, need to say, you need to sage. Sage around. I, I feel like it. I should buy a lottery mm. ticket, is what I think. <laughs> um, so, so I'm going to jump in as though I miss nothing um, <clears throat> and ask you, what has been the most challenging part of of the tr the journey from like leaving school and getting to where you are now and that can be anything it can be pragmatic it can be esoteric it can be philosophical what is what has been the most challenging for you mike go ahead i'm sure as an entrepreneur that's <laughs> yeah um you know it it's pretty much every day there's like little challenges um for me you know, being, um, owning a, a business and being like the boss of business, I'm not a, a business person. So a lot of that was just learning everything, like as you go and just getting more comfortable with the role. Like when I first opened the studio, um, being in the position of being a boss, technically it wasn't something new. It's something I was directing artists before then. And, you know, I was critiquing stuff and giving feedback and anything that's involved with being a director, but suddenly had, having like a tangible office and employees there suddenly became a lot more real. And I, I didn't quite know, like, I suddenly felt like I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so that was a challenge at first, but, you know, um, it's something that's just second nature now where you're just, you know, it comes with experience and time. It's just being comfortable with your position and what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But it also just kind of feeds into your confidence of the new challenges that come along that just, they don't seem as daunting. Like, okay, I got over this and I'm perfectly comfortable in the position I am now. Um, when a new challenge comes along, if it's a new type of production or a new type of art style that you're not familiar with, you know, it's a hurdle, it's a challenge, but it's something that, you know, you're kind of, you've been steeled up for and you're ready for, and um, it just doesn't seem as a big of an issue. So it kind of just makes those new challenges a bit easier to, to uh, get over as you go. I'm going to hit you with a follow-up question to that. Like, um, I think a good, a good thing to hear about a little bit would be, where did you turn for advice on how to be someone who owns a business? Uh, that's a great question. I was lucky enough as I was kind of before the studio came about, I was, uh, my writing partner and I, we had sold a couple shows to, uh, networks and stuff like, 
uh, Nickelodeon and Disney, and um, we were had the opportunity to get to hang out with other animation studios, like Disney being one, but like other medium sized ones larger than what I am, but kind of picking those uh, the people's brains at those studios of just like what the day to day life is. And as people that I still keep in contact with now, it's it's a huge resource for me. Um, so places like Six Point Harness, uh, they're an amazing animation studio. And um, just, you know, the people who are at these studios, they've been through all the same stuff that you've been through or I've been through. So some of the challenges that I'm facing are things that they face, whether it's on a larger scale or for a different project, but it's something that you can immediately relate to. And it just, I, I was literally on the phone with uh, Brennan from Six Point Harness like a month ago, and we were just sort of venting a bit or just talking about production issues. And he's working on a much larger scale, but our issues were the same. So it's it was a great, like it's comforting, you still have to deal with the, the issues at hand, but it's it's great to know like, oh, this larger studio is going through the same stuff. So like, I'm gonna be okay. Like they're getting through it. There's a pathway through that and I can follow that. So that was like, for me, it was networking and, um, you know, leaning on some of the people that have been through it before or in like a larger position than I am or I was and uh, learning from them. Nice. How, how about you, Audra? Ooh, Lord. I think a lot of my decisions are more life decisions, right? So my husband's an attorney um, and he's a lobbyist. So he's based out of Tallahassee, Florida. We have three young girls. The oldest is 11 in middle school, fresh in middle school, and a two nine-year-old. So now most of my decisions are predicated around, okay, how can we keep this family intact? What are they doing? What's he doing? I mean, he's on like law, legal politics. I was like, ugh, like I just <laughs> yuck to me. And now I'm like ingrained in it because I kind of know and like, oh, well, he doesn't know. And let me, you know, whatever. But, you know, most of his business is across the state of Florida. So my opportunities felt limited, especially being in Tallahassee, right? Like this is not Miami. I tell people we're in South Georgia. Like this is not Florida. This is not the beach and stuff. Um, so for me, it was just more of like, okay, how do I create opportunities for myself? Right. So, um, you know, we got married and we we're starting a family and I was working at SCAD in Savannah. And I told the president, I'm like, I got to figure this whole, <laughs> I got a baby, a husband, I'm going to you know, take a break, move to Tallahassee. And that's when I started my own studio. And like back in the day, this is before, I don't even know if, what they call it up north now, but it was like, um, oh God, the paint me mine kind of thing. Like the, you know, sip and paint, whatever I was doing that, but I like, think that's what we call it. Sip and paint. Right. Right. <laughs> so sip and paint. And this is when like Pinterest was starting to come around and people would always ask me like, how do I do this wreath? How do I paint this wine glass? How do I, I'm like, wait, I got teaching experience. I love going to Michael's and Joanne's and every art supply store there is like, I got my own studio. Why don't I just do this? My husband's like, oh, this, no one's going to whatever. And the, the ironic thing is I ended up going to law firms and doing like their holiday parties and like, sure the guys who were reluctant to do it ended up like, I want to make an extra ornament. I went, I'm like, mm -hmm, I know because my background in education told me that you would want to do this again, you know, but it's just funny how things kind of like, you know, again, just following your passion, what you do, networking, building relationships. I was volunteering everywhere. And I'm like, okay, well, what's next? Like I got to do something. And the opportunity kind of presented in my, to me, um, they need a new executive director for this arts council here. I was encouraged to apply and I got it. So I, again, not part of my life's plan, like this is and how things are supposed to be, but boy, did I stress about it in grad school. I was like, I need to know the answers. I need to know what's next. <laughs> I need to know where I will be. Right. I'm going to be in Chicago. And look, I'm in Tallahassee, like, who knew? <laughs> and loving it. And loving it. I, I, I will say I'm a weather girl. Corlin, I don't know how I did the snow and the things up there, <laughs> like, I'm a little whiny brat. Like I love my coats, but oh my gosh. Um, Probably half, half the folks listening to you today are like, I hear that. I hear you. <laughs> like I, I resonate. <laughs> resonate. Yeah, but hurricanes. True hurricanes. Oh, and there's no real Christmas without snow. So, I mean, there's that too. You can't have everything. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't have everything. So, so given that you had these challenges, you, these challenges you didn't foresee, you met them on your own, you figured out how to, how to tap into networks or relationships or um, how to take opportunities that presented themselves to you, even though you might've been afraid to take them, right? Mm -hmm. That's super important. But what experience did you have at UConn that you felt maybe 
was the most helpful to you in preparing for, you know, what you're looking at as your future? When you think back about your formal education, um, which is a, a, a bedrock, like it's a foundation for, for how you move forward. What was the, the most important thing or the most useful thing or the best thing or the thing you remember the most? Ooh, I'll go. I have a couple things, right? So I have a, and I, even a couple of classes. So there was, I'll start with foundations because there was one class and I don't know if this assignment still goes around, whatever. And the, the assignment was to collect an object. You didn't know what it was for. And you just collect hundreds, thousands. I don't know. I picked crayons and then you had to make a body of armor, like a piece of body armor or something. So I made crayons. I made like a skirt with patterns. I literally think it's still in the basement at home. Um, that, and I just remember, oh my God, I was sewing chicken wire. Oh my God. It was a nightmare, but it was just one of those like, okay, stick with it, stick with it kind of things. Um, wood shop and raise class. I was terrible at it. And I will never forget someone burning their project and getting an A. He was like, they're so passionate about it. They burned it. And I'm like, what, you know, but it just changed my whole frame of reference. Like blew your mind. Like, um, but then assignment in your class. And again, I keep telling people, y'all take this internet for granted. You told us, you're like, you made us go to an industry. And I remember I went to a book publisher in New York. Well, first of all, you had us go to Society of Illustrators. Love that. Always love that show. But then we had to go meet with like a publisher and like present your materials. And I think that was really my first time in like, oh, wait, this is not like an assignment. Like this could be real life work. Like, oh, this is what people do, you know? And it just yeah. kind of gave me that insight and that confidence into like <laughs> meeting someone for the first time or maybe hearing rejection and dealing with it and pivoting and, and kind of going from there. So I still remember those trips to New York. I always love those. Like just getting off campus. And I always tell people, I'm like, you get so used to going to class, being on campus, mm -hmm. sticking there, like mm -hmm. reach out. And especially with Instagram and Facebook, the way things are and LinkedIn, I'm always looking at people on LinkedIn, making new friends, like reach out to people. You just never know where a context going to lead you. So I think it was that, like what you instilled in us to like reach beyond. Right. And things and people are more accessible than you think they are, mm -hmm. but you do have to be the one to take that step and like say, hi, <laughs> how about you, Mike? Uh, yeah, I think for me, it was the, the balance of uh, creativity and schedule. Um, so specifically, like I mentioned before, like doing a comic for the paper, it was four, four comics a week. Um, and then, um, that along with, uh, your, the independent study course where I got to animate, um, classes. So like that was, you know, assignments are one thing for a class, like there's, you know, you have a certain amount of time to do it and you can kind of spread it out across that time. It's managing your schedule and managing you know, sort of a plan to begin with, and then you go from there. Whereas with like the the daily comics or with um, the animation, you know, it's it's deadline based, and you're sort of like you can't wait for creativity or inspiration to strike you. Like this is this is a job now. Like you have to be creative, almost on demand, or just like keep that creative part of your brain going more often. Yeah, and strengthen it that way. Um, and I mean, that like directly correlates with every day of my life for the past, you know, 20 years, basically of, um, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that was the biggest, like, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I was able to pull from, from UConn that relates to my daily life now is just that sort of like, I ha I have to come up with four comics today, or I have to draw this comic today and make it look, you know how I want it to look, or I need to, you know, make sure that I get X amount of seconds done and get it done the way I, I like while I'm learning this program at the same time, that kind of thing. So that was a real like balance of creativity, schedule, and, you know, just keeping with the workflow and uh, trying to be throughout all that stuff, like organized at the same time. I know being creative and organized kind of go at odds sometimes, but like, you know, when you're, uh, a freelancer or running a business or anything like that um that's insanely important to to be organized you know with your files or if you're working digitally or anything like that is just like trying to meld those two sides of the brain together um and that, that kind of stuff like helped a ton that you or, or fitting into someone else's workflow yeah right you know in order to do that you have to have things together on your end 
And, and but uh, would you say that you sort of find your own way to be organized? Everybody's pretty different. I would imagine it, it, just knowing the two of you as I do, even back then, I would say probably you have very different approaches to how you organize or get organized or um, how you learned to become organized because we don't always start that way. We learn it. What do you think? Yeah, I was fortunate enough. My first job out of UConn was for a package design firm um, called HMS Design. It's something different now. I'm not sure what it's called. But I learned a ton there. Um, one, I was thrilled because I was a uh, graphic design and illustration major. And literally my first day on the job there, I was doing graphic design and illustration. I was like, I can't believe I'm already applying my degree towards a career. Um, but the... the um, uh, the system that my boss had, we were dealing with lots of files and like sub files, stuff that's like, a, you know, linked to an illustrator file or whatever it might be. And we had like a central server, lots of different projects going on. And to have that organized in a way where if I need to find a project from like two years ago, where there was like one linked little like illustration of a peach that was like on a, on a Snapple label, like I needed to be able to find that without digging through thousands of stuff you know so like that system i stole that system ex like verbatim and i use it today and like i'm able to find animated you know files or drawings from 20 years ago in less than five minutes it's a, it's it's an amazing system that like i was just lucky enough to to be exposed to and like just absorb so that was like a ton and i you know it's refined a bit now but like that was a, a huge, huge help. I would, I would, would you say that's your superpower? No? <laughs> yeah. That's a that's superpower. A superpower. No, I don't <laughs> have it. I do not. <laughs> I do not. Yeah, but, but you. you work in an administrative position, Ooh. a leadership position in an oh. institution that's a large institution. So you got your own style. Oh yeah. But I'm still, listen, like I dream of being like Mike, like things are here and they, like, I have that, well, who that doesn't? desktop that you're like, oh my God, like people <laughs> cringe. The IT guys are like, what are you doing? You know, like stuff is everywhere, but like the way I'm, I'm like a day to day, right. You know, when I was in teaching, it was, you know, you had to plan out, you got to plan for the week and plan the lessons. Like I thrive though, in like the unknown and like adapting and figuring it out and like, okay, we got this, let's do that. You know? But I'm surrounded by people where there's a good blend of that, right? Like the people who can plan it out. Like now with this giving team that I'm on, I'm like, I have a very strategic thinker. I have a person who lays things out. But like the other day we had a major donor come in and he's like, oh, I invited all the media and our PR people flipped out. Everyone flipped out. They're like, what do you mean? You know, I'm like, we'll get this. We'll do, you know, like that's where I kind of thrive. Like I'm okay with it. It's the like, Oh, the strategy for the year. But what if this goes wrong? And what if that goes wrong? But I will say my day to day, and you just witnessed it. I'm forever taking notes on my phone. I got to write it down because I'm going to forget it. If I say I'm going to send, oh, let me connect you to that person. I literally have to stop and do that email intro right then because the thought will then move on to something else. And I have this big old notebook. I have notes from everything, life, the kids, work. I just, I have to write it down. And then like, I can go back at the end of the day or the next day. I'm like, oh, hey, what did I talk about? Who would I meet with? I make a little to-do list. I need to email this person. I need to say, you know, create this list and I have it. So the next day I can look back like, oh, that's what I said I was going to do. Or just make that simple top 10, just do this. Yes, oh my gosh. <laughs> and people, and I, I will tell you, Coraline, you did teach me a love <laughs> of great fine pens, like good pens, mm, good penmanship. Yes. I'm like, that's what my yes. degree got me some good penmanship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm usually responsible for certificates. And did you, like I was that. just going to say, do you do certificates? Oh yeah. I do all the things. I write the thank you cards, all that, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that this is actually awesome for the, the audience that's here to hear because you, it sounds like you have very divergent styles and it's proof that there's success like in divergent styles. Mm -hmm. So I think that's super important. Um, <clears throat> I think, well, I think that the, another question I'd like to ask, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage people again to put whatever they, questions they have in the chat. Um, I may have lost stuff that was already in the chat when I got booted off and had to come back on because my chat looks empty. So if you put something there before. Oh no. 
Who knows? Yeah, Foster. I know. <laughs> Another <laughs> power search. <laughs> I think I need to get a screenshot, et cetera. Et cetera. Oh, oh we just go. lost you for a second. You're back. You froze oh, for a, a Am minute. I back? Okay, yep, good. You're good. Yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on here. Squirrels, maybe. <laughs> um, but you you we talked about very pragmatic things. What we haven't talked about is sort of the value of networking, which I prefer to call relationships, because mm-hmm. networking sounds kind of cold to me. Mm-hmm. And it's more about um you end up having relationships with people, and that's kind of how you maybe get work and continue working with some people or discontinue working with some people if the relationship doesn't really work out. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you learned to do that? Because I think for a lot of us who are artists, we start out as very interior people. It's part of what makes us good at what we do, right? The ability to, to be alone and be by yourself and just do that work. We actually have to learn how to have relationships with other people, especially in this business sense, which is for a lot of us, very foreign. Can you address a little bit about, well, how did you learn to do that? Did you feel like you're always good at it? Did it change? What do you think? Uh, I mean, for for me, uh, Coraline can attest to this. I I had said maybe like seven words in my UConn career in your class. I, I didn't want to be the one to bring that up. <laughs> but you both yeah. were very. I'm just going to say this once. You both were very reserved mm-hmm. as yeah. as students, and I just felt like inside those clams. There are pearls. <laughs> all my students like they're they're all clammed up. There are pearls in there. I just have to crack that open a little bit. <laughs> but it does. So the cracking open doesn't always happen until later. Yeah. Um. So it, it took me. What was nice was like in person. I I was very quiet. But like if it's like an email or a phone call or whatever like that, it, there's something like that extra wall there that just helped me personally to just sort of like open up a bit more. It was just easier to put my thoughts together and out in an email or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I feel like that was my, my sort of strength early on was just in, when it came to networking, just reaching out to people, seeing if they were interested in working together on a project or, you know, if somebody reached out to me, um, being able to like compose like a, a thoughtful sort of, there's a lot of like diplomacy of sorts when you're budgeting for a project or whatever it might be. So trying to be open and flexible, like learning that kind of language of being personable and at the same time, like being able to communicate what you what you need from this project and being clear about your goals and like the parameters and everything that that both parties need to follow that kind of stuff i feel like that helped me a lot um with just networking in general uh because from there i mean now my days are uh, a ton of like zoom calls like this or you know before 2020 just going to meetings and and whatnot just being just more comfortable with it and now it's like uh, you know you don't even think twice about it but um during that time, like a lot of my business for the studio is was word of mouth, where I would work with a client, working with producers or a director. A lot of times they'll only be at one place for a couple of years. They'll move to another company. They need work there. We had a good working relationship from networking. They come back to me like, hey, we need a we need, you know, an animated short for something or other. Can you do that? And we already have this great working relationship. And it just sort of like you know, spider webs out from there or whatever you want to call it. So for me, like that was my main part of um, like biggest growth for networking. And then it was just other stuff that I wouldn't normally have done. Like years ago, we would do uh, conventions like Comic-Con and things like that without just to circle back to it, like mm-hmm. not having a plan yeah. for it. I'd just be like, I'm going to go promote my cartoons. And like, if somebody had one follow-up question of like, why I'd be like, ah, I don't know. I just, I'm going to go do it and see what happens. So doing that, there's a ton of relationships that I made from those uh, days at Comic-Con that, um, you know, I still have today. And from that, like a ton of opportunities and projects and stuff came about that. So, you know, it was a mix of like learning to be professional and um, like to to put your thoughts out there clearly, like in an email, help have that translate into meeting in person and just being consistent with like your voice from the professional side. Um, and that was, for me, that was like my biggest strength for networking. Ooh, I got so many stories on that. Coraline, yeah. you know, I tell people the story. I still remember I had to give a speech, like saying thank you to like for a scholarship. And it was in a building. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this is the welcome center, what building is at the end of the track. It was new at the time back two decades ago. 
but I still feel my heart jumping out my chest, reading off the little note card, like shaking, like, oh my God, I don't want to do this. Like probably three sentences, but I, I feel it still. Right. And like, now I do it all the time. I'm like, oh, and let me tell you this. And da, 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 da. you know, like I have fun with it. I lean into it. Anything you do, it just comes with experience. Right. Like I was, and I used to look at my mom because my mom was the outgoing, like, I'm like, how does she do this? Oh, this is act, like yeah, oh, right. stressful. I can't. Right. And I'm like, oh, I'm my mom. Okay. Like I have, it's like full circle, but because just because I'm around her at the events and like I had to do it and you're put on the spot and you just, you lean into it. Um, but I will tell you one thing that I always would talk to students about is building your brand. Even before you graduate, don't wait till you graduate. Like you are your brand, your brand on social media, your brand on whatever it is, because even when I was in Tallahassee trying to figure out what do I do, I was like, well, I have some time. I want to volunteer. And I'm like, well, I asked my husband, like, how do I get on boards? Like, what do I do? And he's like, oh, don't worry. You get on one board. Every board is going to ask you to get involved. And then right. it just got to the point where if people would ask, I say, well, I only do boards if they're related to the arts or children. Like I had to narrow it down to that. But then I kind of branded myself in the community as the arts person. There's hundreds of artists here, hundreds, but they knew me because I worked with them on a board. I volunteered. And it, it wasn't that I was better than another artist. They just had the relationship with me, right? Like, oh, I know her. Let me ask her. They felt safe to say, hey. And if I didn't have the answer, I'd like, oh, well, meet this other person. She does watercolor too. And she does, you know, whatever it is. So build those relationships in that way. It doesn't have to be this, let me show you my resume and who I am all the time. Sometimes it's like this innocuous, like, oh, you know, we, I saw you at that reception and, you know, I liked your dress, whatever. I had this funny story real quick. Like my husband, again, took me to a political fundraiser at Yawn, all the things in Atlanta. And I was <laughs> like, we're just standing in the back, like, oh, it's so dry. This is so, oh. And I looked at this woman, I'm like staring at her earrings. My husband goes, oh, one day, baby, I'll get you those beautiful, you know, probably thousand dollar earrings. And she, the girl looked at, I'm like, oh, I just, I'm just admiring your earrings. Sorry. My name's Audra, whatever. We are friends years later, turns out. And just, if y'all don't know, if you see me on social media, I'm obsessed with Beyonce. Like I love me some Beyonce. Okay. That's a side note. Turns out the couple we met, the husband, he's like a Grammy award winning producer produces Beyonce. Like just did break my soul. Like that was him. Okay. So you just never know just offering someone a compliment on their earrings. We go out to dinner all the time. We're buddies. They come to Tallahassee. We go on trips. Like you just never know. So networking relationship building could be as simple as, wow, where'd you get those shoes? Hey, where's the bathroom? I mean, it doesn't have to be this whole like stressful thing. And it's just funny how that kind of stuff works out. So yeah, that is, that's, that's great. great advice. Yeah. It's great advice from both of you. Um, I'm going to say we've got uh, my little alarm went off for like questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a question in the chat that says, how do you keep in touch with your connections? Like, how do you, how do you remain in touch with your connections? You could end up with a lot of connections and some are more casual, sort of the way uh, Audra's talking about people she met. Some maybe are more formal. How do you keep in touch with with either of those or both of those yeah i think oh go ahead Audrey. Yeah. well just one my husband again he's like mr relationship guy and i was like oh i moved they forgot me like i'm done you know i'm so used to moving around but he's like dude stay in touch with the president and founder of scat like i'm like she doesn't want to hear like whatever and so like i swear i think he was sending stuff like if i was doing stuff in tallahassee he would send her stuff and then all this bouquet would arrive at the door. I'm like, what is this? Like, how does she know? You know, but like what you may think maybe a burden or, Hey, want to show you an update on what's going on. Then they start looking at you as like, Oh, and then that's really what grew me for this position I'm in. Cause she saw like, Oh, you're doing that in the community. You're doing that. I want you to do that up here in Atlanta. Like I want you to do that. So it's, it could be an email. It could be, Hey, let me share with you this article. Let me share with you this new work I just did. You know, it could be email, social media, like actual mail, actual mail. I will tell you is like, I love, I still love getting like actual mail. Not right. Mail. Like if someone sends yeah. me packages, I get invitations to stuff where it's like hand done or like something I want to say, love that. Send At our stuff. house, it's, it's, we call it, it's like our little treasures. It is. So, I mean, those are just some ways, but I mean, it doesn't have to be super formal, but if it is your work, create a newsletter, share with people you know, and if you don't hear a response, don't get offended. I get, I tell people all the time, if I didn't respond to you, please email me again. Like 
my inbox is ridiculous. Just right. don't, you know, hit me on LinkedIn, hit me on Instagram, whatever it is. Like, I will tell you, stop email me, which I never do, but like, <laughs> it just depends on the person. Right. How about yeah. you, Mike? Same. Nice. Like, you know, doesn't have to be formal text messages. Like, Hey, what's up? Just seeing what you guys are up to blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, just be friendly and, for and like casual with it. Uh, other stuff, if it's like a, you know, a client or something that you worked with them, you know, a year ago, like, Hey, just checking in, see if you guys got anything or, you know, just keep it light. There's nothing like, there's no real trick to it. It's just like taking five, 10 minutes every once in a while. And just like, Hey, whoever <laughs> I talked to in a bit, I'm just going to see what they're up to. Um, a lot of it. Yeah. It's like social media, just text, quick email, just back and forth or whatever. Um, and it's just kind of keeping it in the back of your mind every once in a while. It's like, oh, I haven't talked to this person in a bit. I liked working with them. You know, let me just see what they're up to. And simple as that. And it just kind of keeps, you know, see like usually at that time between like if it has if it's been like a year or something and they've moved to a different company, just seeing what's new with them there, you know, and like new experiences that they've got and um, new opportunities that might come up, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, there's no real trick to it. It's just, you know, whatever, whatever works. Awesome. Uh, again, I think it's a lot less complicated than we think, but the fear factor is, is big. So you have to do the things that you are afraid to do. You have to just like say that thing. I, or Mike, earlier you said, I think I'll sign up for Comic-Con and you do. And then you, you're on it and you have to do it because you did that thing. And you're like, wow, I can't believe I just did that, but I did. So now I have to follow through, yeah. you know? So that can be a, a, an easy way to kind of motivate yourself. Um, we have a question in the chat that asks about starting your own businesses, your own studio. Like what were the first steps? How did you decide to do that? And what do you feel the benefits are versus working as an employee for someone else? So you both have some experience with that and with the other. So what do you think? Audrey, it, go ahead. it depends on if you got to know your strengths and weaknesses, right? Like, you know, some people are like, I just need everything to be the way it is. I love like responding to things. So, you know, if I wanted to flourish in my own business, like I know I'm going to have to continuously bring stuff in. Whereas I like more solving the problems, fixing the things, bringing the people together, you know? So I do like working for someone else, even though I still like doing my own thing and having my own Corlin, did I ever tell you about my needlepoint habit I picked up during COVID, by the way? That was just- Perhaps not. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I, I, and it's funny for me, when I was doing my studio, the funniest thing is I got hung up just in the name and branding. Like, don't worry about all that. Like, get the work, like start the work. Sometimes you get so hung up on like, everything has to be this and the website and then this and then this, but like you're creating experiences, right? If you're an artist, you're creating something all of that will come together. You just don't get lost in the like, well, if it's not this, then I'll never get this. Like you get, you do get hung up on the most innocuous, doesn't make sense things. And yeah. sometimes you just got to go. Right. And like, I started my yeah. business, I would have a party. I throw a party for free. And then like the word of mouth was insane. I'm like, nope, can't do that. Wait. And then I started getting people who I had no idea who they were. Like, it was usually like, I would bring in different groups and you know, and then it just started mushrooming it. And then, you know, just have your stuff in order. Like, what does it take for you? What, what are your lines? What are your boundaries? What, what do you view as success? Cause you can always chase something and not know like, what's your goal? What are you trying to do? Is it the money? Is it the freedom? Is it the big clients? Is it the consistent? Is it having a big, you know, whatever it is. So you got to kind of be clear on what you want rather than worrying about somebody else's standards of what success is and what you think you should be doing. Just focus on what you do like doing. I think that's a really important point too, about um, not trying to understanding that if you wait to feel settled and ready and that you feel like, yeah, that's going to be, um, I'll know it's right then when I feel settled and ready, you'll wait forever because mm -hmm. that moment never comes. You never feel hundred percent ready for just about anything. You got to, you got to know that that's a, a sort of a false assumption that you're trying to make. Um, Mike, how about you? Well, uh, owning your own business, you went into that kind of early and you've, you've pretty much stayed with that. Yeah, it was, you know, being compared to like working for somebody, like the obvious thing is just the level of like security where it's like, all right, I got a job. I got a paycheck every couple of weeks. Great. 
if I can advance in the company, fantastic. If I have spending money for just hanging out or just living comfortably, great. Um, which was which was fantastic. You know, I, I worked there for five years, and at a certain point, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm coming home from work and I'm animating until like one, two in the morning every night. Like something, there's something behind the reason why I'm doing that. I probably should pursue this more. And then opportunities came up. I'm like, I'm going to just, you know, like screw it. I'm going to go for it and just make the jump. And so, uh, you know, I left my job and I had some uh, stuff lined up and I was like, all right, it's kind of all or nothing now. Like let's, let's go. Um, and that was enough like motivating factor. My, my wife, my girlfriend at the time also left her job to pursue her own business as a, a product photographer. So we're both at the same time, like, well, if this works, like, let's go. And like, but that was like enough motivation. And um, like, as, as much pressure as it is, it's also a lot of freedom of like, I, you know, have all these, I can do whatever I'm, I'm hoping to do, whatever opportunities come along. If I can make my own opportunities, great. Whatever stuff comes along, let's see where it takes us, uh, that kind of thing. So like that part of, uh, owning, opening a studio was, um, it, and still is like, great. It's, um, um, I love the feeling of like a new project coming in and seeing how we can, um, you know, from a technical standpoint, like, let's produce this smoothly. Let's get everybody on the same page. Like, let's make, let's get all the client's needs in there that we want. And let's also find opportunities to what I call plussing it, like adding stuff to it without, you know, taking away from what the client wants. I love all that kind of stuff for it, but I also, with all that is just like the creative, um, uh, you know, the opportunity for creative input in all of this stuff. They've come to us for a reason. Uh, they like what we do and, um, you know, let's, let's make this project better than the next, than the last one. Um, but, you know, probably my favorite part of us having a studio is not only like the creative, like scratching that creative itch for myself, it's I have a small studio of directors and animators and production managers and people here where allowing them to be collaborative and creative with everything as well. Um, and, you know, allowing them to, to put their, their stamp on it and like taking some uh, ownership in the uh, creative process um, is awesome. It's something that like, I loved at my old job and, you know, we really try to focus on having it uh, as collaborative as possible here as well. A lot of it is like giving notes on stuff, but it's also like, you know, giving feedback, but um, doing it in a way where their creative input, it takes the forefront and I'm just kind of steering them up like, well, let, what's the reason why we're making that decision? Is this what the client is asking for? Is it more than what the client asked for? All that kind of stuff is, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a huge like joy for me, that part of just like, building a building an environment a community of uh creative people where we can all kind of work towards the same goal that's awesome i'm gonna i'm gonna say um one of the questions that's related to that is you know you both then worked uh full-time before doing something entrepreneurial on your own and how did you get that first position the question is about did you have internships where is a good place to start um, I, and the question specifically refers to a lot of adverts you might look at, ask for two to five years of experience. So if you don't have that, do you not apply? Could be yes, could be no, depends. Uh, but how would you say, respond to a question like that? How did you start? Ooh, I'll tell mine was kind of a natural start because I literally got my master's in art ed and taught like, but I had all of those hours and, you know, years of teaching internships, that kind of a thing. Um, but I think, you know, moving into any other job, you just have to speak to the skills and experience you have, right? I'll give you a funny story. I mean, again, I keep, God, you got career development now. I wish I took advantage of this. Um, you know, before like you could Google the art jobs, I was working, I did a summer thing at Wadsworth Anthenaeum and I'm like, oh, I, I would read the ads and the jobs and like, oh, registrar, I want to be a registrar. That sounds sexy. Until so I went into the basement. I'm like, wait, what do you do all day? Like, what? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. You know, yeah. and thank God I volunteered for the summer there so I could see the ins and outs of the museum and the thing that looks so cool in the job classified. Like, oh, no, oh, no, that's not it. So I would say get any experience you can volunteering internship a week, a weekend a volunteer, whatever it is, 
just so you know, you're not wasting your time because a lot of times you think, oh yeah, this is totally what I want to do. And you're like, oh my, oh no. Mm -mm." Or like these yeah, people I got to work. Like you will find out very quickly. um, It's pretty abstract until you actually try it on. Until you do it. And then let me tell you, like, I think that's the thing that a lot of women do. No offense to the guys in here. Like we have to be a hundred percent qualified for everything that the job description says. And you really do not, you know? I interview people all the time and sometimes it's just, are you a good fit? Are you teachable? Can I teach you? Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to admit? I don't get this. I'll find the answer kind of thing. Yeah. I'm bringing you on versus the the one who's- Yeah. The advert can be a wish list. Oh yeah. It's a wish list formed by a committee. So Mm -hmm. five people made up that advertisement and it's what they all want. Mm -hmm. And it may not have been updated in years (laughs) since the last person who left to open that position. But I just, you know, always sell yourself in the qualities, right? Like, oh, I don't have this experience, but I do have experiences doing blah, blah, blah. I am this, you know, I've researched your company. I look at the type of people you have, reach out to them on LinkedIn. Hey, what are y'all, you know, there are so many ways that you can back around into a position um, and it is selling yourself. And it's hard because like, it's sometimes feels icky. Like I'm the best. And no one ever really always wants to like, I'm the best, look at me, you know? And it's awkward, but like, if you really want the job and just say, I have this experience, I'm, I'm weaker in this. I need to learn more, but I'm a quick learner. I'm a fast learner. I can take these programs, software. I can work with this, for whatever it is. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. How about for, you, Mike? I mean, so much of my, uh, you know, weak, is probably reviewing portfolios, different types of portfolios, whether it's like demo reels, um, you know, illustration, uh, character design, background design, prop design, stuff like that. So for a lot of the stuff that we're looking at, we're reviewing, um, years of experience doesn't necessarily come into play. Um, it's really just like, you can, you can make your own experience just by continually creating. If you're animating, if you're demo reel, for an animation, if you're looking to, to get into animation, um, you know, a lot of demo reels that, that I get, it's like 30 seconds of sort of like the same style and and your style of animation is whatever your style is that, you know, if it happens to match a project that we're working on, great. If I can see some skill sets that can apply towards some stuff that we're doing great. Like, you know, if it's a character animated, if it's like, you know, looks like, uh, Bob's Burgers or something like that. And like your style, I can see some elements of Bob Burgers in there. Great. So if you haven't, you know, if you're out of school, you haven't had an animation job at a studio or whatever, that's does not matter to me. If your demo reel is like, like you've put some work into this, there's some different styles, like you're studying, like, you know, take advantage of YouTube and like tutorials and stuff, whether it's free stuff, whether it's like cheap, you know, classes or whatever that they have. The, the resources, it's ridiculous what you can um, learn on your own. And, you know, seeing that applied towards a demo reel or seeing that your character design portfolio has like different styles, like, you know, obviously work in your style, that's what you're comfortable with, fantastic. But like having somebody who can be like a Swiss army knife of like, I can also do props in this clean style or this one that's like more like funky or whatever. That's the stuff that I look for in a studio. I know other places do as well. It really sort of depends on like what, uh, you know, project we have going on or, um, you know, just like reviewing your overall kind of skill set. So, you know, don't feel too daunted by like, if you're looking for a position at a studio, don't feel daunted about the years of experience needed. It's really like spend that time or spend some time developing your portfolio or your demo reel to have it feel well-rounded. Or if you're going to apply to a place, you know, that, you know, does a certain style of stuff, like kind of front load your portfolio, your demo reel with some stuff that might match that style, you know, customize it just like you might customize a a resume. Um, So that sort of thing, like, you know, that, that years of experience thing can really be circumvented by um, just developing your skill set on your own, basically. You know, a quick thing to add to that, you know, because in this day and age, your content, you, you, you're, you don't know who's looking at your stuff. Right. And especially, you know, during quarantine, all eyes were on screens and Netflix and content was the king. Like the studios were like, 
we're just going to dub over stuff in English. Like we can't even get content in created fast enough. So also think about industries outside of where you think you're supposed to be. So we do this thing called SCAD Pro. We work with these Fortune 500 companies. One example is BlackRock. There's this big financial global corporation. Like finance to me sounds like boring, right? But what we did for them, the students created this kind of like training and, and custom consultation training for their consultants as they were onboarding. And it was funny because at the midpoint of the presentation, they're like, oh my God, the animation student just did in one minute, what our 500 page manual cannot, we did not know we needed an animation person in-house to explain this, you know? So sell yourself to people who may not realize, I didn't know I needed you. You know, they're, they don't, they weren't our school. They just think art belongs in museums and on the walls. Like they don't understand the full scope of what artists do all the time. I still explain to my friends, everything is designed. Even bad voting ballots were poorly designed by somebody. That's why they're, you know, like, all of this. So, you know, you always have to kind of educate people. I think a lot, like you get closed, like everyone knows, no, everyone does not know. So if you have a particular skill, you can show a company, you go to their Instagram, you're like, your Instagram's terrible. Your branding's terrible. This is what I can do for you. I mean, you can create your own business now, like going to companies, going to people, meeting the right person and just reaching out and letting them know, here's what I do. Here's how I can help you. You'll I think that's a real key thought right there is that, yes, we assume other people understand the role of art and design and how, how really impactful it is at every level of our lives, because that's how we feel about it. And we sort of have surrounded ourselves with people who also recognize that. And so we forget that once we get out of our little cocoon of our Yukon class, our peer class, our peer group, or our professional organizations, we forget that you know, people need to learn about how important we are. Like we matter, we're interesting. Artists and designers and animators, photographers, actors, actresses, playwrights, the arts, we're interesting and we matter. And we need to understand that ourselves, that we have to communicate that better to an audience. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna 